Hey guys, welcome back, it's Ripe again. In today's video, I moved into a new house and a ridiculous HOA president had my car towed out of spite. He claims I must join his HOA and ended up vandalizing my car. Here is what happened, let's dive right into the story. The first one starts like this. I did not even have time after moving in to start hating the HOA before they decided to just come after me. I had moved into a new house and one of the biggest perks in my opinion was that the HOA was not mandatory. I had a choice and I didn't want to be part of one and I didn't have some big dramatic reason for that decision. I just did not make a lot of money and without worrying about HOA dues I would not have to play the well known game of can I afford groceries this week or not. Me saying I wasn't gonna join when I closed on the house must have gotten to the HOA president quickly because the exact same day I moved in he came and introduced himself. Be warned that he didn't come by to be nice and welcome me like some might assume. I'm just gonna refer to him as the HOA as a whole since he is the only member I really interacted with. So HOA guy, hey there, I see you're moving your stuff in, that's great. See, I came by because I think you made a little error when you signed the papers for your home. Me, um, are you from the real estate agency? Did I forget to sign one of the papers or something? HOA, oh no, my name is Karen and I run the HOA here. You never signed the papers to join, so I figured I would just come down here and have you sign them. Me, that was not a mistake though. I just don't want to join the HOA. No offense. HOA guy, I'm not offended, but I think you should really reconsider. Everybody else around here is, and you never know what can happen while you're in bed asleep. We can help protect you from any problems and make sure you are safe. Me, with all due respect, if something horrible happens, I would just end up calling the cops, okay? I might consider it again in the future, but for now, I'm sure I don't want to join. I could tell that he was angry and wanted to say more. His face morphed during the conversation from a fake smile to a scowl and then eventually back to his fake smile. He told me to just consider it again and how it would be a huge benefit for me to join. I finished moving my stuff in and spent the next few days just trying to get settled. On the fourth day of me living in this new house, I watched as my car was being hooked onto a tow truck and taken right from in front of my property. I tried to get them to unhook it and told them that I was parked legally. He gave me some lines about how once the car is hooked, he is not allowed to unhook it. I don't know if that's a company policy or just him being lazy and not wanting to do what I said. Also, as I am standing there, I see none other than HOA guy himself with a much more real looking smile this time that turned to fake concern when he saw me looking. He told me that he was so sorry about my car getting towed and I could go into town to see what the issue was. I had a strong feeling that he had something to do with it, but I refrained myself from getting into a fight with him. I did not want my new neighbors to think that I was a hothead or anything. Of course, when I went to town, I was told that the HOA had everything to do with my towing and I needed to go to them to find out why. After wasting my time with that pointless trip, I was back to the HOA with paperwork showing that they had my car towed. That was when he decided to tell me that my car being parked was against the HOA policy and that was the reason for it being towed. That they had a rule that cars not registered with the HOA are subject to towing. He claims it stops suspicious people from wandering around the neighborhood and makes people feel safe. That if I wanted to park my car in front of my own house, it would need to be registered with the HOA. Which by the way also required joining the HOA. What he did not know is that my wife who was moving down a week after me, the old house sale got messed up and one of us had to stay back and get that sorted, was a paralegal. Every lawyer in the firm owed her favors and taking the HOA to court for my car back was something they found an easy way to repay her. Every lawyer in the firm owed her favors and taking the HOA to court for my car back was something they found an easy way to repay her. He looked things over and said that it was open and shut and that they did not have any right to either make that a rule or enforce it to begin with. We all met with the HOA and his lawyers to discuss the release of my car. Our lawyer slammed into saying that any judge would grant me this and look back at all the other illegal towing if it went that far. 
that they did not have the authority to say cars needed to be registered with them for many reasons. One being, it made no sense because it implies nobody in the neighborhood could have visitors without cars getting towed. Also, it meant the voluntary nature of the HOA was being violated as they were using it to force people to join. They folded and my car was released back to me. If you think the HOA handled this by just walking away, then you have not been around the internet long enough. So this HOA guy wanted to make my entire life hell after losing in court and went right off the deep end into doing it. Once again he decided my car was the magic thing he wanted to attack and ruin. Maybe it was nicer than his or something, but I just find it hilarious that his war on me seemed to also be a war on my car. I was woken up to my car alarm going off and looking out the window to see the HOA guy with a baseball bat destroying it. That's the kind of thing I was trying to tell him from the beginning of why I did not need the HOA for protection. I just called the cops to say that he was out there wrecking my car and within a few minutes they arrived. He could have, and probably should have, dropped the bat and surrendered. He probably would have just had to pay for damages and got a note on a record or something, but instead he was not paying attention and swung at the first body he saw, probably thinking it was me. Getting a cop right in the side with the bat and being immediately taste for it. They also found a switchblade on him which is illegal in my state to have. My best guess would be that he was also gonna slash my tires when he was done with beating my car with a bat. I know I don't seem that bothered by the entire thing, but I don't get super attached to physical things unless they have sentimental value. The car was about 8 years old and had a ton of miles on it already. It was not anything special and him hurting it wouldn't hurt me. Having a violent crazy guy living near me though was a different story and I did not want him anywhere near me or my wife. Luckily when he was arrested and charged they piled everything they could think of on him. Hitting that cop was gonna hurt his chances of staying out of prison. He also had to pay me back for the car damage but that was the least of his worries. He was being sent to prison for destruction of property, carrying an illegal weapon, assaulting a police officer and resisting arrest. I don't know if they had other charges on him but these were the ones that stuck. He was behind bars and boy did I feel a lot safer when I found that information out. There is still an HOA around here but he seemed to be the only insane one in that bunch. Nobody else had tried to bully us to join so I can infer that they are either scared to mess with us or just not crazy like that guy was. And here ripe stars indeed sometimes it just takes one person for things to get out of control. Especially a guy who controls an HOA and tries to be a little power hungry dictator. Either way if you still enjoy the HOA stories please don't forget to like the video and maybe even leave a comment because that would help me tremendously. Thank you so much and the next one is titled Revenge on Dad. Okay, so the homeless guy in question is technically my dad. My dad was only in my life actively from ages 0 to 7 and at that time gave me a crap ton of trauma. He was a hardcore alcoholic manipulator and a lot of other things I cannot say. My mom being the badass that she is left him and for a short bit we did weekends at his place. It was a never ending cycle of him drinking being a POS and then buying us over with animals and gifts. After getting several DUIs, unpaid child support and a few child endangerment cases he up and left to avoid going to jail. Like disappeared, left the animals locked in the house that he abandoned and shut off his phone. Every few months or so he would randomly show up at my school drunk and crying with gifts in hand or leave notes on our door. My school literally had to implement a safety plan because my mom was scared that he would take me. That stopped though and we did not hear from him for about 13 years. When I I was 20 he messaged me on Facebook saying that he would love to get to know me and asking if there is anything I need financially. My initial response, sick to my stomach and crying, quickly turned to anger. I was broke and really could use the money and I mean he owed me right? I told him I would meet and needed money for rent. When I saw him though my stomach turned. He looked like the crazy guy you see on the side of the road begging for money. He really did not make much sense, just talked a lot of crap about my mom, saying that she was a liar and turned us against him and mumbling nonsense. Apparently his brother, my uncle, that I've never had a relationship with would no longer give him money but would wire transfer him money for me. He told his brother I needed 1500 bucks and he told me he would take 500 and give me 1000. His crappy burner phone ran out of minutes so one of the calls to his brother was made from my phone. 
Of course, he did not have an ID or anything, so I would need to pick it up with him. When someone wires you money, they get a code and then give you the code and voila, you get the money. My dad would not give me the code until we were physically at the place to pick it up. Which, by the way, we plan to do the following morning. The next morning, I decided to text my uncle, since I now had his number, and ask him directly for the code. I got the code, picked up the money, and blocked my POS dad. He made sure to leave me some deranged voicemails about how big of a POS I am. He pretty much used me to get money from his brother. If he really wanted to be in my life, he would have taken the proper steps to do so and change, but he never did. Not denying what I did was not bad, but also, screw my dad. And the next one is titled, Screwing Over the Terrible Manager. Backstory, I work in a residential facility for people on probation. They can serve out a sentence there on work release or if they are sentenced to our drug treatment program. So they come and go a lot. Part of my job is sending anything new they bring back to the property office to be inventoried or held as contraband. Stuff that's not illegal, but they cannot have it in the facility. It's like chewing tobacco. They are not allowed to bring outside food or drinks, so part of my job is throwing it away if it's perishable or unwrapped. This guy returned with a bag of burgers and burritos, his job was throwing away, so I disposed of it and he complained to the policy compliance manager who runs the property office. She told me that I had to get with that client for financial reimbursement. I tried getting her to understand that I threw that stuff away because it would not keep back in the office as her own policy states and she did not care. Her words to me were, property officers are the ones who sort through the property for contraband or disposable items. Your job is not to review the property, just bag it up and label it with their name. Everything goes through property, she even underlined the word everything in her email. It felt like she was making up her own rules despite what policy said because she didn't want to deal with a complaining work release inmate. The malicious compliance, yesterday a client returned with a half-eaten bag lunch we provide people leaving for work in case they cannot feed themselves. I saw my opportunity and I did exactly what you think. I sent a brown bag of half-eaten sandwich and cornbread to be inventoried as property. I saw her email today going off on me for being passive aggressive or that I need to be retrained. She normally doesn't CC anyone else in her emails about issues, but she did today. My direct supervisor, the operations commander and the deputy director were all included so they could see her witch me out over the half-eaten food I sent her staff. She must have felt like Obi-Wan having the high ground, too bad she did in fact underestimate my power. I included even more supervisory staff in my response and directly quoted her original emails to me and pointed out that she told me her staff were the ones that throw things away and that I was to bag and tag everything. I was later told by my laughing supervisor that the director himself laughed as he told her, you told him to send you everything, you cannot get upset because he did what you said. Edit, some of the common notifications I'm getting are from people apparently really upset that I'm throwing food away. While I do agree it's important to look out for people trying to get their life together on probation, please let me reassure you that we feed them three meals a day in our cafeteria and make them food trays to be saved for later in a fridge set aside specifically for people who miss meals due to their work schedule and always have bag lunches made fresh daily for them to take with them when they leave. There are even vending machines available to them. We are not starving them if they try to bring in outside food. The rules about outside food are made clear to them daily. A1. Just chill. And yeah, Riper Stars, that is one of the things about Reddit. People are very quick to assume things even though they don't know the entire background. That's just Reddit for you. If you have watched this far, I would just like to point out, if you enjoy my content, please also check out my podcast on all major podcast platforms such as Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts and all the others by searching for Ripe Stories and you will find me. On there you will not only see early access to new videos but also exclusive stories that you won't find anywhere else. Either way, the next one is titled Don't Steal Food. So I saw a story of stolen food at work and it reminded me of one of my husband's stories so I decided to share it. Over 15 years ago my husband was a nurse technician at a private hospital in a small town in Brazil. At the hospital there was a constant problem of food being stolen from the employee's fridge and there were constant complaints but the administration would just ignore them. One day my husband brought a pot of cream cheese worth about 50 cents and put it in the fridge and when his break came he saw it missing. He went to HR to report 
report the theft and they told him that since it was not hospital property, there was nothing they could do. My husband said, is that so? And turned around and left. He went to the phone and called the cops asking them to come because there was a theft. He didn't tell them what was stolen. Now, private hospitals in Brazil have a big thing about image, so when two cop cars arrived at the front of the hospital, everyone from patients, employees, HR, and even the top administration came to see what was going on. One of the cops that arrived ended up being one of my husband's uncles, so he just went straight to ask him what happened. My husband, with the most serious expression, just told him loud enough for everyone to hear that he wanted to make an official report that someone stole his 50 cent pot of cream cheese. There was a general silence before his uncle asked, are you serious? If I knew this was about a 50 cent pot of cheese, we would not have come and we would have told you to go to the station to make the report if you wanted. My husband just answered with a smile, I know, that's why I didn't say what was stolen and now you have to make the report, which he did. Obviously, the police would not do anything about it, but because of the whole circus that my husband created, the next week the hospital installed a camera right in front of the employee's fridge and the food theft finally stopped. And the next one is a story from r slash am I the a-hole. I, 20 female, used to live with my mom's stepdad and stepsister who's the same age as me. When my mom married my SD and moved them in, I was 12 and from the get-go it was obvious that there was something wrong with SS. I won't even attempt to speculate at a diagnosis but she got really clingy, would throw tantrums and pee herself if she didn't get her way. Also, she couldn't regulate her voice and would just blurt whatever she was thinking and touch or take whatever she wanted. Basically, she has zero self-control or awareness. I talked with her parents about getting her into therapy and getting her a diagnosis and I was scolded and grounded for bullying her because that counted as bullying for them, so I never brought it up again. But she latched on me and it ruined my life. She refused her own room, was put in every one of my classes. If I talked with someone else, she would throw a tantrum and pee herself at school and I wouldn't end up having to take care of her. If I was invited somewhere else and she wasn't, I was not allowed to go. The only thing I had was swim team because the coach took pity on me and allowed her to join so I could participate. When I was a junior, I turned 18 and got access to some money left to me by my dad and grandparents. That's when I made a plan, I got a P.O. box and didn't tell the parents. They told me that I'll be going to the same college as my sister and I did not argue and used the P.O. box to apply to other colleges. I got into the farthest one I could get into and last summer after graduation, I bailed in the middle of the night, only took sentimental things and left everything including my phone. I left a letter and another with the neighbors so they would not file a missing people report. It's been almost a year and I just checked up on them, stalked them online and for the first time, apparently, my SS is committed and the parents are no longer living together. And while I feel vindicated when it comes to the parents, I feel like an a-hole towards SS. I know that it was not her fault and with me, there she could live more or less normally, now she is in a facility and all her support systems vanished. So reddit, am I the a-hole? And here ripe stars, I'm very curious about what you have to say, let me know if you think OP is the a-hole or not. Comment number one said, not the a-hole, your parents failed both of you. It sounds like running was the only solution, I hope you're doing better now. Comment number two, not the a-hole, and it is suspicious that your SS got committed after you moved. You are an adult in college, so I wouldn't call it running away essentially. It seems like you were forcibly assigned to be the caretaker of SS and that was basically the only reason why your stepdad and your mother were together. You did nothing wrong and you just protected yourself and your future from being forced to be your SS lifelong caretaker. Good for you OP, may you recover the life that you were forced to give up. And now let's move on to the next story. It starts like this. About seven months ago, my wife and I bought our first house. Before this, we were renting a condo, which was pretty nice, but we wanted to be able to actually own the property that we lived in. Plus, this house had a pretty nice backyard where my son could play and that driveway wrapped around to extra parking in the back. The backyard was mostly situated on the side of the house, but it had a nice hill to it. Of course, when we bought the house, we immediately started fixing it up. Not that it was in bad shape at all, it's just now we could actually do repairs and make our space more tailored to us versus before when we were renting. There was no fence or property line between us and the neighbors next door, so I thought I should buy some cheap wire fencing so that my son would not wander off into the neighbor's yard. 
And before someone says we should be watching him, if you have a toddler, you just know how fast they can move. Now, I noticed that the next door neighbor's lawn was overgrown and that their backyard was significantly bigger than ours. I thought that they would be okay with my son playing in their backyard. Now, don't mistake me for an entitled neighbor. I did want to make sure it was okay and if it was not a big deal. I also thought I would offer to mow their lawn for them in return for them letting our son play around in their backyard. Well, they did not like that idea. They had told me that we better stay off their yard or there was going to be problems. Obviously, I didn't want problems at all and if they did not want us even stepping foot in their yard, well, I wanted to respect that. I just figured that there was no harm in asking, but this could also be a chance to get to know our neighbors and vice versa. But like I said, I wanted to respect their wishes, so the next weekend my wife and I start buying stakes, markers and some cheap fencing so we can mark the property line and enclose our backyard. We bought some of that fence that rolls up. While we were putting the stakes in the ground to mark the line, we could see our neighbors watching us from their second story window. I thought that they were either making sure we were not overstepping any boundaries or they were just nosy. Well, it turns out it was the first option because the very next day when we went outside to go work, there was a bunch of old rusted children's toys and some playground equipment sitting right where we were when they were watching us. A few weeks ago we had a serious incident with these neighbors. My mother-in-law, who some might consider a just no mother-in-law, but that's a story for another day, wanted to be the babysitter for our child. My husband insisted that we should at least let her try, so that is what we did. And well, mother-in-law ended up getting drunk and not watching my two-year-old. Unfortunately, he ended up getting outside and crossed the property line to the neighbor's land. The neighbors totally freaked out and called the police on my two-year-old after my drunk mother-in-law did not respond to their angry shouting. They demanded that the police trespass my son off their property, which was obviously ridiculous. The police returned my son to my house and had a serious word with my drunk mother-in-law. And yes, we went full no contact with her after this. Obviously, this was already weird. It was clear that they did not even want us near their property line and my wife made a great point that the rusted kid's toy was saying, hey, keep your kid off my lawn. They did not like kids. Who knows, my wife also swears that when we spotted the rusted equipment that the curtain on the neighbor's house moved as if someone was watching them. I also happened to know some people and decided to find out who actually owned the property next to us. It turns out it is not these people. I had a feeling, don't ask, sometimes I just know, and that they were just renters. Well, I was able to find the actual landlord's information online and decided to send him an email stating that I was concerned because their tenants were storing rusted equipment next to our property line and our son could easily get hurt even if he was staying within the boundaries. I also let him know that they are not mowing their weed slash backyard and it could easily be a hiding spot for rodents and whatnot. I have no idea if that's actually true, I just made the second part up to spite them. Is that wrong of me? Anyways, a gentleman named Steve emails back and thanks me for the information and that he will be out the following weekend to inspect what is going on. Surprisingly, he actually does come out the following weekend and the toys and rusted stuff is still there. Steve tells them that they have a certain amount of time to clean it up and get the grass mowed because it was a part of their renter's contract. I also took this time to introduce myself to him when I saw him standing out by his truck. I let him know that I was not trying to cause any trouble, that I just wanted to report it because it really could be a safety concern. He told me that he had kids so he completely understood. A week passed and the equipment was still there. So, since I was feeling that I was on Steve's good side, I decided to shoot him another email and tell him that the equipment is still not cleaned up and my son has not really been able to go out into the backyard because we fear that he could trip and fall and get scraped slash cut with this rusted equipment. Steve sighs on the phone and I could tell that he was frustrated. He even mentions that he is tired of paying property taxes on a property that is not being maintained. And right then and there an idea came to me. I offered to buy part of his land so that it would make our backyard bigger and cut into his backyard. I even told him that I could help him maintain his yard as his renters were not doing so and guess what, he agreed. 
So not only was our backyard going to be bigger, but the next door neighbors had to eventually pick up the rusty equipment because it was on our property. Ha! Sucks to suck. Oh, and by the way, my wife and I did eventually get the fence put in. And with this, we have reached the end of the video. However, if you cannot get enough of my content, please check out my endless playlist where you can find thousands of hours of content. In addition, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel to not miss any of my daily uploads. Thank you so much in advance and I hope to see you again tomorrow.